Chapter 2 of Abraham Lincoln and the Abolition of Slavery in the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Abraham Lincoln and the Abolition of Slavery in the United States by Charles Godfrey Leland. Chapter 2 in 1830, Thomas Lincoln had again tired of his home and resolved to move westward. This time he did not change without good reason. An epidemic had appeared in his Indiana neighborhood, which was besides generally unhealthy. Therefore, in the spring, he and Abraham, with Dennis Hanks and Levi Hall, who had married one of Mrs. Lincoln's daughters by her first husband, with their families, thirteen in all, having packed their furniture on a wagon, drawn by four oxen, took the road for Illinois. After journeying 200 miles in 15 days, Thomas Lincoln settled in Moron County, on the Sangamon River, about 10 miles west of Decatur. Here they built a cabin of hewn timber, with a smokehouse for drying meat, and a stable, and broke up and fenced 15 acres of land. Abraham Lincoln was now 21, and his father had been a hard master, taking all his wages. He therefore, after doing his best to settle the family in their new home, went forth to work for himself among the farmers. One George Cluse, who worked with Abraham during the first year in Illinois, says that at that time he was the roughest looking person he ever saw. He was tall, angular, and ungainly, and wore trousers of flax and tow, cut tight at the ankle and out at the knees. He was very poor and made a bargain with Miss Nancy Miller to split four hundred rails for every yard of brown jean, dyed with walnut bark, that would be required to make him a pair of trousers. Thomas Lincoln found, in less than a year, that his new home was the most unhealthy of all he had tried. So he went westward again, moving to three new places until he settled at Goose Nest Prairie in Coles County, where he died at the age of seventy-three, as usual, in debt. From the time of his death, and as he advanced in prosperity, Abraham aided his stepmother in many ways besides sending her money. It was at Decatur that he made his first public speech, standing on a keg. It was on the navigation of the Sangamon River, and was delivered extemporaneously in reply to one by a candidate for the legislature named Posey. During the winter of 1831, a trader named Denton Afoot proposed to John Hanks, Abraham Lincoln, and John D. Johnston, his stepmother's son, to take a flat boat to New Orleans. The wages offered were very high, fifty cents a day to each man, and sixty dollars to be divided among them at the end of the trip. After some delay, the boat, loaded with corn, pigs, and pork, sailed, but just below New Salem, on the Sangamon, it stuck on a dam, but was saved by the great ingenuity of Lincoln, who invented a novel apparatus for getting it over. This seems to have turned his mind to the subject of overcoming such difficulties of navigation, and in 1849 he obtained a patent for an improved method of lifting vessels over shoals. The design is a bellows attached to each side of the hull, below the water line, to be pumped full of air when it is desired to lift the craft over a shoal. The model, which is 18 or 20 inches long, and which is now in the patent office at Washington, appears to have been cut with a knife from a shingle in a cigar box. John Hanks, apparently a most trustworthy and excellent man, declared that it was during this trip, while at New Orleans, Lincoln first saw Negroes chained, maltreated, and whipped. It made a deep impression on his humane mind, and, years after, he often declared that witnessing this cruelty first induced him to think slavery wrong. At New Orleans, the flatboat discharged its cargo and was sold for its timber. Lincoln returned on a steamboat to St. Louis and thence walked home. He had hardly returned before he received a challenge from a famous wrestler named Daniel Needham. There was a great assembly at Wabash Point to witness the match, where Needham was thrown with so much ease that his pride was more hurt than his body. In July 1831, Abraham again engaged himself to Mr. Afoot to take charge of a county store in New Salem. While awaiting his employer, an election was held, and a clerk was wanted at the polls. The stranger, Abraham, 
being asked whether he was competent to fill the post, said, I will try, and performed the duties well. This was the first public official act of his life, and as soon as Afoot's goods arrived, Lincoln, from a day laborer, became a clerk, or rather salesman, in which capacity he remained for one year, or until the spring of 1832, when his employer failed. Many incidents are narrated of Lincoln's honesty towards customers during this clerkship, of his strict integrity in trifles, his bravery when women were annoyed by bullies, and of his prowess against a gang of ruffians who infested and ruled the town. He is said to have more than once walked several miles after business hours to return six cents, or some equally trifling sum, when he had been overpaid. It is very evident that he managed all matters with so much tact as to make fast friends of everybody, and was specially a favorite of the men with whom he fought. It was now that he began to cultivate popularity, quietly, but with the same determination which he had shown in acquiring knowledge. To his credit be it said, that he effected this neither by flattery nor servility, but by making the most of his good qualities, and by inducing respect for his honesty, intelligence, and bravery. It is certain that, during a year, Mr. Afoot was continually stimulating his ambition and insisting he knew more than any man in the United States and would some day be president. Lincoln himself knew very well by this time of what stuff many of the men were made who rose in politics and that, with a little luck and perseverance, he could hold his own with them. When out of the store, he was always busy, as of old, in the pursuit of knowledge. He mastered the English grammar, remarking that, if that was what they called a science, he thought he could subdue another. A Mr. Green, who became his fellow clerk, declares that his talk now showed that he was beginning to think of a great life and a great destiny. He busied himself very much with debating clubs, walking many miles to attend them, and for years continued to take the Louisville Journal, famous for the lively wit of his editor, George D. Prentice, and for this newspaper he paid regularly when he had not the means to buy decent clothing. From this time his life rapidly increases in interest. It is certain that, from early youth, he had quietly determined to become great, and that he thoroughly tested his own talents and acquirements before entering upon politics as a career. His chief, and indeed his almost only talent, was resolute perseverance, and by means of it he passed in the race of life thousands who were his superiors in genius. Among all the biographies of the great and wise and good among mankind, there is not one so full of encouragement to young poor men as that of Abraham Lincoln, since there is not one which so illustrates not only how mere personal success may be attained, but how by strong will and self-culture the tremendous task of guiding a vast country through the trials of a civil war may be successfully achieved. In the spring of 1832, Mr. Afoot failed, and Lincoln had nothing to do. For some time past, an Indian rebellion, led by the famous Black Hawk, chief of the Sac tribe, had caused the greatest alarm in the western states. About the beginning of this century, 1804 through 1805, the Sacs had been removed west of the Mississippi, but Black Hawk, believing that his people had been unjustly exiled, organized a conspiracy for which a while embraced nine of the most powerful tribes of the Northwest, and announced his intention of returning and settling in the old hunting grounds of his people on the Rock River. He was a man of great courage and shrewdness, skilled as an orator, and dreaded as one gifted with supernatural power, combining in his person the war chief and prophet. But the returning Indians, by committing great barbarities on the way, caused such irritation and alarm among the white settlers that when Governor Reynolds of Illinois issued a call for volunteers, several regiments of hardy frontiersmen were at once formed. Black Hawk's allies, with the exception of the tribe of the Foxes, at once fell away, but their desperate leader kept on in his course. Among the companies which volunteered was one from Menard County, embracing many men from New Salem. The captain was chosen by vote and the choice fell on Lincoln. He was accustomed to say, when president, that nothing in his life had ever gratified him so much as this promotion. And this may well have been, since, to a very ambitious man, the first practical proofs of popularity are like the first installment of a great fortune paid to one who is poor. 
Though he was never in an actual engagement during this campaign, Lincoln underwent much hunger and hardship while it lasted, and at times had great trouble with his men, who were not only mere raw militia, but also unusually rough and rebellious. One incident of the war, however, as narrated by Lamon, not only indicates that Abraham Lincoln was sometimes in danger, but was well qualified to grapple with it. One day, during these many marches and countermarches, an old Indian, weary, hungry, and helpless, found his way into the camp. He professed to be a friend of the whites, and although it was an exceedingly perilous experiment for one of his color, he ventured to throw himself upon the mercy of the soldiers. But the men first murmured, and then broke out into fierce cries for his blood. We have come out to fight Indians, they said, and we intend to do it. The poor Indian, now in the extremity of his distress and peril, did what he should have done before. He threw down before his assailants a soiled and crumpled paper, which he implored them to read before taking his life. It was a letter of character and safe conduct from General Cass, pronouncing him a faithful man who had done good service in the cause for which this army was enlisted. But it was too late, the men refused to read it, or thought it a forgery, and were rushing with fury upon the defenseless old savage, when Captain Lincoln bounded between them and their appointed victim. Men, said he, and his voice for a moment stilled the agitation around him, this must not be done. He must not be shot and killed by us. But, said some of them, the Indian is a spy. Lincoln knew that his own life was now in only less danger than that of the poor creature that crouched behind him. During this scene, the towering form and the passion and resolution in Lincoln's face produced an effect upon the furious mob. They paused, listened, fell back, and then sullenly obeyed what seemed to be the voice of reason as well as authority. But there were still some murmurs of disappointed rage and half-suppressed exclamations which looked towards vengeance of some kind. At length one of the men, a little bolder than the rest, but evidently feeling that he spoke for the whole, cried out, This is cowardly on your part, Lincoln. If any man think I am a coward, let him test it, was the reply. Lincoln, responded a new voice, you are larger and heavier than we are. This you can guard against. Choose your weapons, returned the captain. Whatever may be said of Mr. Lincoln's choice of means for the preservation of military discipline, it was certainly very effectual in this case. There was no more disaffection in his camp, and the word coward was never coupled with his name again. Mr. Lincoln understood his men better than those who would be disposed to criticize his conduct. He has often declared himself that his life and character were both at stake, and would probably have been lost had he not at that supremely critical moment forgotten the officer and asserted the man. The soldiers, in fact, could not have been arrested, tried, or punished. They were merely wild backwoodsmen, acting entirely by their own will, and any effort to court-martial them would simply have failed in its object and made their captain seem afraid of them. During this campaign, Lincoln made the acquaintance of a lawyer, then captain, the Han T. Stewart, who had subsequently a great influence on his career. When the company was mustered out in May, Lincoln at once re-enlisted as a private in a volunteer spy company, where he remained for a month until the Battle of Bad Axe, which resulted in the capture of Black Hawk, put an end to hostilities. This war was not a remarkable affair, says J. G. Holland, but it was remarkable in that the two simplest, homeliest, and truest men engaged in it afterwards became presidents of the United States, namely General, then Colonel, Zachary Taylor, and Abraham Lincoln. It has always been usual in the United States to urge to the utmost the slightest military services rendered by candidates for office. The absurd degree to which this was carried often awoke the satire of Lincoln, even when it was at his own expense. Many years after, he referred thus humorously to his military services. By the way, Mr. Speaker, did you know I was a military hero? Yes, sir. In the days of the Black Hawk War I fought, bled, and came away. Speaking of General Cass's career reminds me of my own. I was not at Sullivan's defeat, but I was about as near to it as Cass was to Hull's surrender, and, like him, I saw the place soon after. It is quite certain that I did not break my sword, for I had none to break, but I bent my musket pretty bad on one occasion. If Cass broke his sword, the idea is he broke it in desperation. I bent the musket by accident. 
If General Cass went in advance of me in picking whortleberries, I guess I surpass him in charges upon the wild onions. If he saw any live fighting Indians, it was more than I did, but I had a great many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes, and, although I never fainted from loss of blood, I certainly can say I was often very hungry. The soldiers from Sangamon County arrived home just ten days before the state election, and Lincoln was immediately applied to for permission to place his name among the candidates for the legislature. He canvassed the district, but was defeated, though he received the almost unanimous vote of his own precinct. The young man had, however, made a great advance even by defeat, since he became known by it as one whose sterling honesty had deserved a better reward. Lincoln's integrity was, in this election, strikingly evinced by his adherence to his political principles, had he been less scrupulous, he would not have lost the election. At this time, there were two great political parties, the Democratic, headed by Andrew Jackson, elected president in 1832, and that which had been the Federalist, but which was rapidly being called Whig. The Democratic Party warred against a national bank, paper money, monopolies, or privileged and chartered institutions, a protective tariff, and internal improvements, and was, in short, jealous of all public expenditure which could tend to greatly enrich individuals. Its leader, Jackson, was a man of inflexible determination and unquestionable bravery, which he had shown not only in battle, but by subduing the incipient rebellion in South Carolina when that state had threatened to nullify or succeed from the Union. Lincoln's heart was with Jackson. He had unbounded admiration for the man, but he knew that the country needed internal improvements and in matters of political economy, inclined to the Whigs. After returning from the army, he went to live in the house of W. H. Herndon, a most estimable man, to whose researches the world owes nearly all that is known of Lincoln's early life and family, and who was subsequently his law partner. At this time, the late captain thought of becoming a blacksmith, but as an opportunity occurred of buying a store in New Salem on credit, he became, in company with a man named Barry, a country merchant or a trader. He showed little wisdom in associating himself with Barry, who proved a drunkard and ruined the business, after a year of anxiety, leaving Lincoln in debt, which he struggled to pay off through many years of trouble. It was not until 1849 that the last note was discharged. His creditors were, however, considerate and kind. While living with Mr. Herndon, Lincoln began to study law seriously. He had previously read Blackstone, and by one who has really mastered this grand compendium of English law, the profession is already half acquired. He was still very poor, and appears to have lived by helping a Mr. Ellis in his shop, and to have received much willing aid from friends, especially John T. Stewart, who always cheerfully supplied his wants and lent him law books. About this time, Lincoln attracted the attention of a noted Democrat, John Calhoun, the surveyor of Sangamon County, who afterwards became famous as president of the Lecompton Council in Kansas during the disturbances between friends and opponents of slavery prior to the admission of the state. He liked Lincoln and, wanting a really honest assistant, recommended him to learn surveying, lending him a book for the purpose. In six weeks he had qualified himself and soon acquired a small private business. On the 7th May, 1833, Lincoln was appointed postmaster at New Salem. As the mail arrived but once a week, neither the duties or emoluments of the office were such as to greatly disturb or delight him. He is said, indeed, to have kept the letters in his hat, being at once, in his own person, both office and officer. The advantages which he gained were opportunities to read the newspapers, which he did aloud to the assembled inhabitants, and to decipher letters for all who could not read. All of this was conducive, in a creditable way, to notoriety and popularity, and he improved it as such. In the autumn of 1834, a great trouble occurred. His scanty property, consisting of the horse, saddle, bridle, and surveyor's instruments by which he lived, were seized under a judgment on one of the notes which he had given for the store. But two good friends, named Short and Bolin Green, bought them in for $245, which Lincoln faithfully repaid in due time. It is said that he was an accurate surveyor, 
and remarkable for his truthfulness. He never speculated in lands, nor availed himself of endless opportunities to profit by aiding the speculations of others. Miserably poor and badly clad, Lincoln, though very fond of the society of women, was sensitive and shy when they were strangers. Mr. Ellis, the storekeeper for whom he often worked, states that, when he lived with him at the tavern, there came a lady from Virginia with three stylish daughters, who remained a few weeks. During their stay, I do not remember Mr. Lincoln ever eating at the same table where they did. I thought it was on account of his awkward appearance and wearing apparel. There are many anecdotes recorded of this kind, showing at this period his poverty, his popularity, and his kindness of heart. He was referee, umpire, and unquestioned judge in all disputes, horse races, or wagers. One who knew him in this capacity said of him, He is the fairest man I ever had to deal with. In 1834, Lincoln again became a successful candidate for the legislature of Illinois, receiving a larger majority than any other candidate on the ticket. A friend, Colonel Smoot, lent him $200 to make a decent appearance, and he went to the seat of government properly dressed for, perhaps, the first time in his life. During the session he said very little, but worked hard and learned much. He was on the Committee for Public Accounts and Expenditures, and when the session was at an end, quietly walked back to his work. Lamond relates, at full length, that at this time Lincoln was in love with a young lady who died of a broken heart in 1835, not, however, for Lincoln, but for another young man who had been engaged to and abandoned her. At her death, Lincoln seemed for some weeks nearly insane and was never the same man again. From this time, he lost his youth and became subject to frequent attacks of intense mental depression, resulting in that settled melancholy which never left him. In 1836, he was again elected to the legislature. Political excitement at this time ran high. The country was being settled rapidly, and people's minds were wild with speculation in lands and public works, from which every man hoped for wealth, and which were to be developed by the legislatures. Lincoln's colleagues were in an unusual degree able men, and the session was a busy one. It was during the canvass of 1836 that he made his first really great speech. He had by this time fairly joined the new Whig party, and it was in reply to a Democrat, Dr. Early, that he spoke. From that day he was recognized as one of the most powerful orators in the state. The principal object of this session, in accordance with the popular mania, was internal improvements, and to this subject Lincoln had been devoted for years. The representatives from Sangamon County consisted of nine men of great influence, every one at least six feet in height, whence they were known as the Long Nine. The friends of the adoption of a general system of internal improvements wished to secure the aid of the Long Nine but the latter refused to aid them unless the removal of the capital of the state from Vandalia to Springfield should be made part of the measure. The result was that both the bill for removal and that for internal improvements, involving the indebtedness of the state for many millions of dollars, passed the same day. Lincoln was the leader in these improvements and was a most laborious member, instant in season and out of season, for the great measures of the Whig Party. At the present day, though grave doubts may exist as to the expediency of such reckless and radical legislation, there could be none as to the integrity or good faith of Abraham Lincoln. He did not enrich himself by it, though it is not impossible that, in legislation, as in land surveying, others swindled on his honesty. It was during this session that Lincoln first beheld Stephen Douglas, who was destined to become, for twenty years, his most formidable opponent. Douglas, from his diminutive stature and great mind, was afterwards popularly known as the Little Giant. Lincoln merely recorded his first impressions of Douglas by saying he was the least man he ever saw. This legislation of 1836 to 37 was indeed of a nature to attract speculators, whether in finance or politics. Within a few days, it passed two loans amounting to $12 million and chartered 1,300 miles of railway, 
with canals, bridges, and river improvements in full proportion. The capital stock of two banks was increased by nearly $5 million, which the state took, leaving it to the banks to manage the railroad and canal funds. Everything was undertaken on a colossal and daring scale by the legislatures, who were principally managed by the Long Nine, who were, in their turn, chiefly directed by Lincoln. The previous session had been to him only as the green room in which to prepare himself for the stage. When he made his first appearance in the political ballet, it was certainly with such a great leap as had never before been witnessed in any beginner. The internal improvement scheme involved not only great boldness and promptness in its execution, but also a vast amount of that practical business talent in which most Western men and Yankees were instinctively proficient. With all this, there was incessant hard work and great excitement. Through the turmoil, Lincoln passed like one in his true element. He had at last gotten into the life which he aspired for years, and was probably as happy as his constitutional infirmity of melancholy would permit. He was, it is true, no man of business in the ordinary sense, but he understood the general principles of business, and was skilled in availing himself in others of talents which he did not possess. During this session, he put on record his first anti-slavery protest. It was, in the words of Lamont, a very mild beginning, but it required uncommon courage, and is interesting as indicating the principle upon which his theory of emancipation was afterwards carried out. At this time, the whole country, north as well as south, was becoming excited concerning the doctrines and practices of the small but very rapidly growing body of abolitionists, who were attacking slavery with fiery zeal and provoking in return the most deadly hatred. The abolitionist, carrying the Republican theory to its logical extreme, insisted that all men, white or black, were entitled to the same political and social rights. The slave owners honestly believed that society should consist of strata, the lowest of which should be bondmen. The abolitionist did not recognize that slavery in America, like serfdom in Russia, had developed into a culture a country which would, without it, have remained a wilderness. Nor did the slave theorists recognize that a time must infallibly come when both systems of enforced labor must yield to new forms of industrial development. The abolitionists, taking their impressions from the early English and Quaker philanthropists, thought principally of the personal wrong inflicted on the Negro, while the majority of Americans declared, with equal conviction, that the black sufferings were not so much account that white man should be made to suffer much more for them, and the whole country be possibly overwhelmed in civil war. Even at this early period of the dispute, there were, however, in the old Whig party, a few men who thought that the growing strife was not to be stopped simply by crushing the abolitionists. But while they would have gladly seen the latter abate their furious zeal, they also thought that slavery might, with propriety, be at least checked in its progress, since they had observed, with grave misgiving, that wherever it was planted, only an aristocracy flourished, while the poor white men became utterly degraded. Such were the views of Abraham Lincoln, views which, in after years, led, during the sharp and bitter need of the war, to the formation of the theory of emancipation for the sake of the country, as opposed to mere abolition for the sake of the Negro, which had had its turn and fulfilled its mission. The feeling against the abolitionists were very bitter in Illinois. Many other states had passed severe resolutions, recommending that anti-slavery agitation be made an indictable offense or a misdemeanor, and, in May 1836, Congress declared that all future abolition petitions should be laid on the table without discussion. But when the legislature of Illinois took its turn in the fashion, and passed resolutions of the same kind, Abraham Lincoln presented to the House a protest which he could get but one man, Dan Stone, to sign. Perhaps he did not want any more signatures, for he was one of those who foresaw to what this cloud, no larger than a man's hand, would in future years extend, and was willing to be alone as a prophet. The protest was as follows. March 3rd, 1837 the following protest was presented to the House, which was read and ordered to be spread on the journals, to wit. 
resolutions upon the subject of domestic slavery having passed both branches of the general assembly at its present session the undersigned hereby protest against the passage of the same they believe that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evils they believe that the congress of the united states has no power under the constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states they believe that the congress of the united states has the power under the constitution to abolish slavery in the district of columbia but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district the difference between these opinions and those contained in the said resolutions is their reason for entering this protest signed dan stone abraham lincoln representatives from the county of sangamon this was indeed a very mild protest but it was the beginning of that which in after years grew to be the real emancipation of the negro never in history was so fine an end of the wedge succeeded by such a wide cleaving bulk much as lincoln afterwards accomplished for the abolition of slavery he never says holland became more extreme in his views than the words of this protest intimate it was during this session also that he first put himself in direct opposition to douglas by another protest the democrats in order to enable the aliens virtually the irishmen in their state to vote on six months residence passed a bill known as the douglas bill remodeling the judiciary in such a way as to secure judges who would aid them against this lincoln e d baker and others protested vigorously but without avail both of these protests though failures at the time were in reality the beginnings of two great principles which led to lincoln's great success and the realization of his utmost ambition during his life defeat was always a step to victory End of chapter 2. Recording by John.